with God. Look, God is God. Trust him. Come on. How many of you did any work to get saved? You didn't. What did you, how did you, how do you know that you're saved? Because you believe. And you have to believe God that whatever your struggle is, whatever your battle is, God will be there to help you. When you cried out and said, save me, God saved you. When Peter was sinking, you remember what he, he said? Help. And what did God, what did Jesus do? He said, it's your own dumb fault for walking out on the water. No. He reached right down to help him. Sometimes, yes, you're out there because you made a bad choice, but God is not trying to punish you in the midst of that situation. He's trying to ask you to help you to see, ask me, I'll help you. Ask me, I'll come to your aid, I'll come to your rescue. You have to take your problems to the Lord. And prayer ought to be that first weapon that you use whenever you face a battle in life. Not the last resort. Sometimes I find that people pray as their last resort rather than their first. The Bible tells me I am supposed to seek what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of the other things. He'll add them to me. God will help me. God will help me. God will help you. God will help anyone. God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I'm a whosoever. I want you to listen to me very carefully. I'm not saying that anyone shouldn't try or do their best. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not just saying, uh, you know, Trust in God means that you do absolutely nothing. No, you've got to pray. And there are some instructional things that I believe that the Lord is going to show you to do. There are some people that God's going to put in your life that will help you and will actually guide you through some things that you need to do. But Jesus is still telling you in all of that, don't make, sure you, make sure you don't take your eyes off of Jesus. Amen? The Christian life is really a life of faith. It's a walk of faith. You know what the Bible says. Walk by what? Faith. Not by sight. That's what our Christian life requires us to do, is to walk by faith. To walk by faith. Look at what James 4, 6 says. Just put this out as a part of your notes. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God is opposed to the proud. And there are some people who are, you know, I don't know if you've got too caught up on that old school song, you know, the one that says, I, I ain't too proud to beg. God don't want you to beg him. You don't have to beg God. God's not asking you to beg him, but he's asking you to use your, 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 your mouth and say, God, help me. That's not begging. To ask for help is not a bad thing. To ask God for help is not a bad thing. But a lot of times we're going, I feel, sometimes in the wrong places and to, sometimes to the wrong people asking for everybody's advice. And everybody's advice is not coming from a place of spirit. Sometimes it's just coming from a place of their experience. I don't want to live based on your experience. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that's proceeding out of the mouth of God. Where is my life? Where is your life? My life is in him. In him I have to live. In him I need to move. In him do I have my being. Make sure you're in Christ. Make sure your decisions are these in Christ decisions. Well, the word is nigh you, even in your mouth. Point number five, for the sake of time, rely on God's power.
I love this expression. It says, you know, the task ahead of you is never as great as the power behind you. Come on. Remember David facing Goliath? He didn't see the task before him greater than the power behind him. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that think that they can defy the army of the Lord? His brother, the army of Israel, they were just simply looking at the size of a mountain or the size of that giant named Goliath. David was looking at the size of his God. Don't rely on your own power. Don't rely on your own power. Rely on the power of God. If God be for you, you know the scripture, who can be against you? Greater is he that is in you than whatever force that you're facing in this world. So learn to rely on God's power, not your power. It's not by might nor by power. This is all being done by what? The spirit of God, the power of God, so to speak. Rely on the power of God. God is well able to do that. Amen? Sometimes we look at God as if God's going to let us off. That somehow your situation is so much bigger and that you can't trust God. And look, I, I can understand this. You, you, you've probably gone through life where you relied on people and people let you down. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, you, 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 you thought somebody was going to honor their word, but they didn't honor their word. They didn't do what they said they would do. But God's not like that. The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. God is not like man that will say one thing but do something totally different. The Bible says God is the same yesterday, today, and what? Forevermore. It would be the equivalent of me saying to someone, come up here, and that's what I was thinking a moment ago, having someone come up here, and then getting the person that I thought was the smallest person in the, in, 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 and, and having them stand by, behind them and say, okay, just fall back. And then you look back and go, you, you think what? They can't catch me. If I, if I fall back, I am going to fall on. You understand? And, and, and sometimes we treat God just like that. We've heard his testimony. We've heard her testimony. But we didn't somehow approach God. But, Lord, my situation is a little different than theirs. Your situation is no different. Your situation is no different than Jehoshaphat's situation. Three armies are coming against Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat has enough in him to realize we don't know what to do. But, God, we're going to get our eyes on you. They start praying. They start fasting, and, and, and folks, they get results by not relying. He could have said, look, how many people are uh, on leave? Call them back. Get the army out. Get the armor on. Get the swords. Get the spears. Get the chariots. Get this. Get that. We're going to war. We could have been... You know, when you go to Israel, they like, like to take you to a, a particular site called Masada. Masada is this mountaintop where Herod had built one of his many uh, palaces. Herod, a very large man, was a very insecure man. And he built a lot of palaces there. A modern-day comparison to him is a man who, who's now deceased called uh, Saddam Hussein, who built a lot of palaces throughout all of, uh, uh, of Iraq because he was afraid that somehow people were going to turn on him. It is said of Hassan Hussein that uh, just about every year he would literally kill his top people around him because he didn't feel like he could ever trust them. Herod was the same way, and he was constantly moving because he always felt that he was going to be under attack. And he built this one palace that he rarely went to, and it's in the southern portion of Israel. It's down by the Dead Sea. Who wants to live by the Dead Sea? 
everybody right now because they found that that <laughs> water is so medicinal. The minerals in the, in the Dead Sea is so medicinal for moving psoriasis and all of these other things. But at that point in time, who wanted to be at, near the Dead Sea? And so he never really went to Masada. And what happened? The Jewish people realized there's only a few soldiers up there. And it was the high ground. And they took it. They took Masada. And they started to occupy Masada, lived there, and were living well, eating up all of Herod's food, storing up. He had all of these places where they stored up water, they stored up food, and, and, and they were enjoying it. But Herod was such an arrogant leader that he said, Don't nobody take nothing from me. And Herod sent an army to take it back. It costs a lot to cross the sandy deserts of that region of Israel to go back and take it. And because the Jewish people had the high ground, they were able to hold them off for a sustained period of time. Matter of fact, they, when they tried to scale the walls to get up, they would pour hot oil on them. They would drop rocks down. And the more that they prevailed, the angrier Herod became. He sent reinforcement. And he sent a number of slaves this time. And the slaves would be the ones that would be on the front line now, trying to take Masada back. Literally, if a slave died, they literally put the dead body on a catapult and catapulted across the wall. You know, after a while, dead bodies are going to do what? They, they, they're going to stink and they're going to start generating disease. I mean, he was just that intent of taking it back. And finally, this is something that Masada is a place where all everybody in Israel, male and female, have to enlist in the military. Male and female. As soon as you come out of high school, college is not a priority for Israel for you. Joining the army is. Male and female. Two to four years, and then some make careers out of it. And so all of the soldiers have to go to Masada because this is what happened at Masada. After a long war, and they realized Herod was not going to give up. How many of you know the devil does not want to give up? The devil will be persistent. That's the one thing that you can say positive about the devil. He is persistent. He is every day seeking whom he can devour. He is persistent. But you have to be even more. They weren't. The children of Israel in that day of Masada weren't. What they did, they did the leader of that particular group, decided that they would take a pack. Each man would kill his own family and kill himself. And the last man, the leader, would fall on the sword and die. Israel looks at that today as one of the most cowardice acts that they have ever done. You see, when you begin to think and the enemy gets you to thinking that you've got to rely on yourself and that you are outnumbered, that you're, you're going to be overrun, you're going to be taken over, He'll convince you that you need to just fall on the sword. He'll convince you that you need to sometimes even take your own life. But who gave you life? God gave you life. God gave you Christ so that you could have life and that you could have it more abundantly. You are more than a conqueror if you will not succumb to the enemy's pressure. Amen? They could have won. They literally could have won, but they lost their confidence. You can win. Look at your neighbor and say, you can win. You, can win. You, you Just don't dash your confidence away. Rely on God's power. Next slide, please, Amy. This is the next point. Relax in faith. I know that's a pretty colorful slide, but it says, worry ends when faith begins. Worry ends when faith begins. 
A lot of people are just worrying, 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 worrying. What are you doing? I'm worrying. Did you go out of the house today? No, I just stayed in the house all day. Did you even open the blinds? No, I didn't open the blinds. I just sat in the dark all day. Worry, worry, worry. Worry will end when faith begins. See, what faith does is take you into the light. The entrance of God's word gives you what? Light. The entrance of God's word gives you what? Life. You can see hope. You can see a future. You can see it brighter than ever before. So if you're going to win the battle, you're going to have to get over into faith. And you're going to have to just relax in that. Amen? Just relax, knowing my God is going to come through. You remember when we talk about the Hebrew boys? You remember what they said? O king, we are not going to bow down. We are not going to bow down. Even if you don't throw us into the furnace, we are not going to bow down. That just made the king a lot more angry, though. And so he turned the heat up and threw them into the furnace. And what happened when they were in the furnace? Not worried about anything. And the king looks down there in the furnace and says, didn't we throw three of them in? But I see what? Four. I see that they've, and you and I know it today, they had angelic help. We talked about that about three weeks ago. You've got help. You've got angelic help that will come and help you. So just relax. Don't get anxious about it. Trust God's word. God will come through. You know, I, I know what it, what it was, Dottie people, she said, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there all right on time. I, I believe that. I, I, I'll sing that song. Uh, he may not come when you want him because sometimes we want God in our timing, and God is always going to come in his timing. And his timing is always going to be the best timing. You know, like I was sharing with you on that flight, my timing would have been get me to the airport, let me walk to the t- next terminal, and get on. But it wasn't God's timing. God had another thing that he wanted to do. And here's the wonderful thing about this. When you relax in faith, look at what he had Jehoshaphat and the the people do. He says, you know, now what I want you to do, unconventional. I want you to get the choir. Come on, folks. We're talking military strategy here now. I want you to get the choir, and I want you to put them out front. All the praise and worship should have been shouting just about then. (laughs) But see, a lot of people don't want to be on the front line. There sometimes that's just where you need to be, on the front line, on the front line, praising. This is why sometimes I, I, I appreciate when people say, Look, I'm just going to get up from my seat. I'm just going to go to the altar. I'm just going to go up to the front line and give some praise to God. You ought to give praises unto God. You ought to continually have praise in your mouth. And he said, now, I want the worshipers to go out. Can you imagine when Jehoshaphat said, you know, I, I'm not going to put my best warriors out here first. They're probably saying, he's setting us up. <laughs> he's setting us up. He's setting us up. We're going to fail. No, you, you're going to win. Yeah. You're going to win. Yeah. You're going to win. Yeah. This garment of praise is going to help you to win the battle. Yeah. This is how I win my battle. This is how I fight my battle. When you hear that song again, I hope you hear it in a different way the next time and that you will begin to realize this is how you fight your battle. This is how you win. This is how you get your victory. This is how you become more than a conqueror in that situation. Amen? Amen. So they, he, he was relaxed. I have faith in God. God said, do this. I'm going to do it. It's not the, the type of military strategy that I would write, but God has wrote it. God has said, do it this way. And he does it that way. And you know what happens? When they get there to the battlefield, what happens? It's so confusing for these three armies that are coming against them that they've turned on each other. And all of the enemy is slain. And you know what happens with the people, uh, uh, Jehoshaphat's people? All they are left to do is to pick up the spoil. And the Bible says it took them three days to get all of the blessings that God had for them. Come on, somebody say, my cup runs over. over. Your cup will be running over. God will just bless you. What the enemy meant for evil, God will turn it for what? Your good, my good, our good. That's what God will do. But it comes with you trusting God and relaxing in faith. And here's the final point that we want to make. If you'll give me that last slide. 
Amy, thank God in advance. Get, thank God in advance. Thank God in advance. Look at this. Thanking God after he answers the prayer is gratitude. Thanking God or thanking him in advance is faith. Some people say, well, when he does it, I'll give some things. No, you, you, the Bible says when I stand praying, I believe that I what? Receive. I remember Fred Price talking one time and he said, you're believing for that, that, that new vehicle and you won't even clean that old dingy, dirty uh, garage out? You ain't got no faith. If you had faith, you'd be saying, look, this is where this thing is going to be driving into, so I got to make room and let me just clean this and clean that. So, come on. A blessing is coming your way. And you start thanking God in advance. G look at your neighbor and say, I am expecting great things. Come on, look at another neighbor and tell him, I am expecting great things. So, church, this, has, this is our theme song. I don't know if you understood that, that God's been speaking to this church and said, you're going to have to start expecting what? Great thing. The devil is going to tell you you're not going to get nothing, but you're saying you're a liar because I am expecting what? Great thing. My God is a great God, and my God is greatly to be praised, and I'm going to praise him while I have an opportunity, while I have a chance. That's what Jehoshaphat that teaches us. That's what Second Chronicles 20 is teaching you. You've got to learn how to just start giving thanks to God, trusting God, relaxing in faith, not being all worried and stressed out, eyes all puffy in the morning because you've been crying all night. What you crying about? Put on the garment of praise. Get that spirit of heaviness off of your life. Amen. Come on, stand to your feet right now with me. Hallelujah. Come on. Anybody know your God? You really know your God? Because if you know your God, you know your God is well able to perfect the thing that concerns you. Michael Stampy one time was writing, and they, they sang this song even already this morning. But when you know our God, our God is powerful. Our God is great. Our God is awesome. Our God is powerful. Our God, come on. Come on, say, our God. our God. See, it's not just about your God, although he is your God, but he's our God. And that's why you ought to be able to encourage somebody else. Our God. Our God. Our God. Come on, let's sing it. Just lift it up. Lift it up and let, let's just sing to the glory of God. Our God. Hallelujah. Our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be reminded one more time. Yes, I know that you're facing some battles. But if you will just begin to digest a little bit more of this. Go ahead and read fully through Jehoshaphat's encounter in Second Chronicles 20. And you're going to find that you're going to find all of your answers there. Because our God, you just got to go in the strength of our God. He's stronger. Whatever the mountain is has to move. Whatever the enemy is is going to be defeated. Matter of fact, already defeated. Amen? And greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Give somebody a high five and tell them we're going home now.